the news agents. I can't see what we've done wrong. Um, Doug and the consortium have simply delivered a contract, a delivery contract of goods. But after everything, you can't see what you've done wrong when you've admitted today that you lied to the press and That's by extension you lied to the public. Yeah, Laura, saying to the press not I'm not involved to protect my family, can I just make this clear? It's not a crime. That was Michelle Moan, Baroness Moan, uh, saying it's perfectly all right to lie willy-nilly uh, to the press and to conceal your involvement in contracts that have made you millions of pounds because you had access to ministers uh, that would pick up your call and deliver contracts worth £200 million to you. I think there are some people might think there are still questions to be answered. She says it's not a crime. And today we're going to hear from a lawyer who thinks it probably should be. The whole question of defamation, the whole question of threatening journalists who are trying to tell the truth needs to be revisited. We're going to be asking what should happen to Michelle Moan now? What should happen to those missing millions? Whether the defamation law needs to change? And what the questions are for the government right now? Michelle Moan says they knew all along. Welcome to the news agents. It's John. It's Emily. And we're going to start by reminding you what all this was about and how urgent everything felt right in the middle of the COVID pandemic when, yes, the government was desperate to find enough protective equipment. Yes, it wanted to reach places it had never gone before to make sure that it had the right equipment in place to help our doctors, to help our nurses protect themselves when they were on the wards in the hospitals fighting COVID. What did they do? They put out requests to, it seems, just about anyone and everyone who could have contacts to come forward if they could offer PPE, if they had a way of getting that protective equipment to the government. And Michelle Moan, who actually made her fortune in lingerie, a bra business, and she was made a Conservative peer by David Cameron in 2015, was one of those to respond. She said, yes, I think we can help you. We know how to make gowns. We know how to make masks. We can get you something that will fulfil the role that is needed. And so they win government contracts worth over two hundred million pounds to supply these gowns. Well, it turns out the gowns were not really fit for purpose and couldn't be used. Still and in so the heap somewhere, and they're in a kind of landfill somewhere. Uh, but she received the two hundred million pounds, and we now know that they made sixty million pounds profit. She denied any involvement all the way through in public. She now says she's a beneficiary of that 60 million. Her husband, Doug Barrowman, said, I had I was not part of the company. And we now know that he was and there was de facto the head of company, which begs a question about his registration at company's house where he says that I had nothing to do with it, which seems to be uh, against the law. And we will unpack that a bit as well. But now we've got Michelle Moan saying, well, the government knew all about it. I may not have told the press. I lied to the press. Sure. But anyone can lie to the press. That's not a problem. But it, she's saying I was truthful to the government. Well, if the government knew all about this yeah. and knew that there was a mismatch, why didn't they do anything about it either? The press started sniffing around this story about three years ago when they were trying to work out this trail of where the money went, much needed public funds and who it had gone to and why it had seemed to go to somebody who was sitting in the legislature in the House of Lords. And as soon as people in the press, investigative journalists, started asking questions, they received the equivalent of slap notices, silencing notices, which can be pretty scary if you're a journalist. People saying, if you touch this story, I'm suing you for defamation. So obviously, the tendency is, if you get something like that, you shut up. These journalists didn't. They went for it and they uncovered the truth about the story, which is why we're now listening to Michelle Moan talking about how all she did was lie to journalists. She didn't just lie to journalists. She tried to threaten them to stop them publishing. And the journalists weren't just finding out those stories for their own good sake. They were finding them out on behalf of the public whose funds were being misspent on this inadequate PPE. So last week, you might have been able to see a documentary, documentary in inverted commas, because the documentary was made by 
um, one Michelle Moan and her husband set out to defend themselves. And then she goes on Laura Kunzberg yesterday um, and trying to say we've done nothing wrong. And I'm not sure that in the court of public opinion, she won anyone over with the interview uh, that she gave. But maybe there is one area and this is goes back to what she has been saying, which I mentioned in the introduction, which is her feeling that she is being made a scapegoat by the Conservative Party for other cock-ups that took place with contracts that were given out for the delivery of PPE. And the government spent something like £8 billion in that horrific time without any due regard to where the money was going. And that is a point that she makes, that it wasn't just us that were profiteering uh, from all of this. And that's why the kind of a COVID inquiry is so important. So a few questions then today. Why is threatening journalists not a crime? You heard her say it wasn't a crime. Trying to cover up, conceal a story by lying. Why isn't that a crime? And what answers does the government have to find? Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister, said that clearly there was a drive to get the PPE in as rapidly as they could. But is this another headache for Rishi Sunak in the making if people around the Cabinet knew things that they never let on? Well, joining us now is Dan Needle, a tax lawyer. If the name rings a bell, it's because he was right in the middle of revealing, helping to reveal the scandal that essentially brought down Nadim Zahawi over his unpaid tax bill when he was in government, in the heart of government, what, almost a year ago. Um, Dan, you were listening to the interview with Michelle Moan and her husband, Doug Barrowman. Uh, what was your sense of what they were pleading when they said all they'd done was lie to the press? Yeah, it's not a crime, she said. And she's right. Lying to the press isn't a crime. But I mean, most of us, when we lead our lives, we don't judge ourselves on whether what we're doing is a crime. We aspire to some higher standard than not being in jail. So... <laughs> On one level, that seems like an astonishing moral failing. On another level, and, and this is really my interest, it's astonishing the libel system lets you instruct lawyers, send threatening letters to people asking them to stop saying something which you know is true, put a bunch of lies in that letter, and then afterwards you can just say, yeah, I was lying to the press, it's not a crime, and you just walk away. So and where... the worst of it is that the more aggressive your lie, the more aggressive your, your lawyers, the greater the chance that it works. It's a bluff, but it works. And you silence what you know is the truth about you. Is it illegal, though, Dan, for lawyers to send a slap notice or a silencing notice to journalists um, if their client is not telling the truth? I'll give you the classic lawyer answer, which is it depends. If the lawyers knew for a fact that she was lying then it was unethical and improper for them to send the letter and they should be struck off. It's quite unlikely, almost inconceivable, that they would do such a thing. But then there's shades in between. So say they didn't know that she was lying. They probably should have suspected she was lying. There was enough out there. The evidence that The Guardian and the FT and the others were going on was fairly clear. What the law firm, or I think there were multiple law firms, what they should have done was say to Baroness Moen and Douglas Barrowman, hey, so, OK, you, you want us to say this is defamatory. What's your answer to the evidence that's being put forward? And if Baroness Moen and Douglas Barrowman at that point refuse to provide any response, and I don't think it's proper for a lawyer to send a letter threatening libel proceedings. Mm. So given where we are now, presumably that law firm can no longer act for either of them given the fact that they went on television and said, yeah, we lied. And presumably the law firm could then say, well, you've compromised us. And could the law firm then sue them? I don't think the law firm can sue them, but certainly my view, and I think that of most lawyers, most solicitors, would be that if you discover that your client has been lying to you in your instructions on a material point, you, you have to stop acting. I want to come on to the whole issue of the defamation law, which is being used by lawyers, it seems, as a way of threatening people when there is no backup. How would you change the law to make this practice in future impossible? One thing that I do is fix the problem Baroness Moon identified. She said it's not a crime to lie 
to the press and by extension not a crime to lie in your libel threats and she's right but it should be so what i'd do i'd create a requirement that if you are sending a letter threatening libel proceedings it has to be accompanied by what's called a statement of truth from the individual behind the claim in which they swear that the accusation made against them is false and that the content of the letter they're sending is true and they should make that statement under penalty of perjury so if it later turns out that they lied they could be prosecuted for perjury i'd go further and say that if it later turns out that something in the in the letter was false not necessarily a lie but false then the recipient of the letter the blogger journalist newspaper whoever should be entitled to sue the claimant and recover their legal fees plus punitive damages and if we do that we're changing the calculation it's no longer a risk free bet for someone to send a libel threat they have to think very carefully about the consequence that they find themselves holding to court by the person they're sending the letter to in what could be a very embarrassing and out of control set of legal proceedings dan what has to happen uh, for that to take place then you're talking about a change in the law yeah so change to the defamation act not a very complicated one my belief is that there would be cross-party support for such a change. I feel that the patience of policymakers has run out on libel. There have been too many abuses in the last few years. I've got one other question, which is about who was in charge of PPE MedPro? And Doug Barrowman said yesterday that he was de facto in charge of the company. And you have said that is deeply problematic. Why? So... Since 2016, companies have been required to declare who their true owner is. Now, often the true owner is just the shareholder, the person you see on the company's books. But sometimes there is someone else, maybe above a chain of companies, maybe above a trust or some other complicated arrangement. That means some other person is the person controlling the company and they have to be declared. And if you don't do it and you know you should have done it, that's a criminal offence. Now, I wrote about three months ago that it seemed fairly clear here that the PPE company, PPE Medpro, was controlled by Douglas Barrowman, but that had never been disclosed. And given that he's in the business of running companies, that's what he does, surely he knew that it should have been disclosed. So it seemed pretty likely he'd committed a criminal offence. And he essentially confirmed that in the interview yesterday. So he incriminated himself. He admitted being the ultimate beneficial owner of PPE Medpro, which means his name should have been on the company, and it wasn't. And what's the penalty for that? Potentially an unlimited fine and up to two years in jail. However, the prosecutions for breaches of these rules have been noticeably absent. This seems a case which is both high profile and extremely obvious. And if the authorities won't prosecute this case, then that sends a clear signal that you can just ignore these rules entirely with complete impunity, which is really the flavour of the interview yesterday, that Barrowman thinks he has complete impunity, and because it was inconvenient for him to disclose his ownership, he just didn't do it. Dan Edel, thanks. Thanks for uh, really enlightening us on that one. Really helpful to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thank you so much. We're joined now in the studio uh, by Nick Thomas-Simmons, Shadow Minister for the Cabinet Office, I think is the fair way to describe it. But you were a lawyer yourself. I was. Yeah, so... Kind of want to get your reaction to what Dan Needle has said to us. I mean, there are so many bits to un- unpack, but let's just pick up where he left off, which was about the way that libel law is being used by lawyers to frighten the bejesus out of journalists, yeah. even if what the lawyers have written down is not true. I think there is a really serious problem here, actually, about people with very deep pockets being able to use litigation to threaten, intimidate, silence. Journalists who are actually conducting investigative journalism, which is in the you know the best traditions of journalism, it's a really, really important part of our democracy. And this is a wider issue, in my view, that does need the attention of government. It does need to have legislative reform because if we don't address this we are going to have a situation where you you think back to the past John you know the situations as well as I do where investigative journalists have got to the truth 
where desperately governments of the day and uh, you know lots of different countries around the world have tried to keep that truth under wraps. And it's really, really important that we do preserve that and as government to do what it can to try to make this a more level playing field than it is at the moment. OK, so here is one way that government can. This is Dan Needle's suggestion. That any letter threatening libel action could be required to be accompanied by a statement of truth. The claimant, i.e. the Michelle Moan person in this case, would have to say that that was true under threat of perjury. Would you back a change to the defamation law that th- made that requirement? I think that that is one of the options that we can look at and it's important we get this right. What we've said is that we would introduce an, an anti slaps law if you like, What's that? Uh, if we came into government. And what that would be designed to do would be designed to redress the imbalance that exists. So what sort of things would, would that do then to do that? I think in the first instance, you need judges to be able to make decisions very quickly in cases of this nature. But secondly, as well, where there are letters that are sent that, let's be frank, have the purpose of intimidating. They're not really designed ultimately to be successful in litigation. They are designed to try and close stories down. So it doesn't even get to a judge. If I got, as a journalist, if I got a letter like that, I would be scared, right? And I'd go to my company and say, am I still going to publish? Am I still going to go ahead with this? And they would be worried on my behalf that I had got my story wrong. So in a way, the onus lies right at the beginning with the person sending the letter. I don't disagree, Emily, at all. And that's why I think we need to look at a a range of measures that will work. But I think it's also important that we rebalance the legislative framework as well. And in addition to judges being able to make decisions quickly, secondly, we need to have increased penalties in costs for where people are bringing these particular, whether in terms of letters or threatening litigation, that you are entirely right is actually not about ultimately succeeding at court, it's about closing down. Honestly, and I think Nick, that rebalance she, she, is really she's important. Just, she or her husband's making £60 million, so the cost thing isn't going to go very far, right? The question of perjury is something that then becomes a crime. What she said in that interview was lying to the press is not a crime. Well, actually, why isn't it if you are dealing with £60 million of public money? I do think we need to look at a range of issues that are both pre-litigation, which obviously this would be. Mm. Secondly, actually rebalancing the legislative framework is very, very important as well. It's about both those things. But the ultimate aim has to be, what is the most effective way we can preserve that really important space of investigative journalism? It's hugely important for democracies and indeed places that are not democracies around the world for exposing truth. We can't have this situation where you have a chilling effect on journalists whose aim is actually to expose truth. Do you think this would have bipartisan support? I would have thought so because the government has actually in the past, this government, committed to reform in this space and you would hope that protecting the space for investigative journalism would command cross-party support. And just going back to the situation of Michelle Moan herself, she's still in the House of Lords. We now know that what has happened has happened, that she lied repeatedly. Do you think the government have been too slow to react to this? And furthermore, do you think that actually the government are quite happy to hang her out to dry and not address the wider issue of PPE contracts? Well, I think they've been extraordinarily slow in a number of particular aspects, actually. The two MedPro contracts are back in the summer of 2020. Yet we know that statements were issued on Baroness Moan's behalf, distancing herself from MedPro, that she has now said are a matter of regret that they were ever issued. Yet throughout that time, no government minister took it upon themselves to come to Parliament to correct the misleading impression that was being given to the public. Secondly, we have a situation now where there are literally estimates of billions of billions of pounds on PPE that have been lost, either on PPE that was unsuitable or where the amount paid for it was way over the odds. Is the government seriously at the moment, in my view, looking with the attention they should be and the energy to getting that back 
absolutely not. And all we can see in respect of Baroness Moan is that, again, this real uh, slowness uh, to act yet again. So throughout this time, we have this situation of this incompetence around the VIP lane for PPE. The current Prime Minister was, of course, the Chancellor at the time, literally writing the cheques, which may explain their slowness to open all this up. Oliver Dowden, who was Deputy Prime Minister, said he knew nothing of it. Robert Buckland, who was also in the Cabinet, said he knew nothing of it. Um, is Labour calling for Michelle Moan to give that money back? What should happen is we've said there should be a COVID uh, corruption commissioner who should be chasing uh, this money. Anything that can be legitimately got back, whether it's in respect of Baroness Moan or anybody well, else, you know this that case. should be I relentlessly mean, the, done. The COVID corruption commissioner presumably has to chase the ones that we don't yet know about. You know the facts of this case now. So do you think she should give the money back? Well, of course, we broadly know the facts of this case. What I've never read, Emily, to be absolutely fair, are the, the individual contracts and so on, which clearly I haven't read in this case. But look, we have... But is it to do with the individual contract? I guess what I'm asking is, we now know that it came through this privileged VIP lane where somebody who was part of the legislature then found a way of making a huge amount of money yes. out of a crisis that then went into her husband's business or fund. Should that money be clawed back? Well, I mean, that's, you don't have to see I mean, what's I mean, look, look to... from a moral point of view, of course, the answer is, is yes. But there's also, I'm conscious of the fact, there's also the civil legal proceedings going on at the moment in addition to a national crime agency investigation. So I really don't want to, you know, cut through the, the legality of it and it wouldn't be appropriate for me to do that. But broadly speaking, if you look at the position the government's got into on this VIP lane, it seems to me with the estimates we have of the billions of pounds that we need to get back, it's absolutely crucial the government does this. It's the public's money. Nick, thank you so much. Pleasure. Something is shifting. Something feels as if it's shifting in the kind of language that the government either uses or wants to use about Israel's invasion of Gaza. And we have to put this in context, which is the terrorist attacks by Hamas on the 7th of October, which led really to an outpouring of defence, defensiveness of whatever actions Israel wanted to take. But here we are, two months on, and things are getting darker and bloodier and more catastrophic for civilians in Gaza. And you can see now that our government, our foreign secretary, is trying to carefully choose a form of words which basically tells Israel they're going too far right now. He says, we don't believe that calling right now for a general and immediate ceasefire, hoping it somehow becomes permanent, is the way forward. But he ends the piece on a more positive note, which is we must do all we can to pave the way to a sustainable ceasefire, leading to a sustainable peace. Now, if you read that in a hurry, it sounds as if he's calling for a ceasefire. He's kind of very carefully not calling for a ceasefire. He's saying that he wishes there were a ceasefire in place and he wants to see actions that could lead to a ceasefire whilst not calling for a ceasefire itself. It's kind of dancing on the head of pins. And it has been an utterly grim weekend for Israel, yeah. for Gaza, for the Gazans. The Israeli Defence Forces kill three of the hostages who are holding up a white flag to surrender, speak in Hebrew to them. And someone is very trigger happy and probably very nervous and very young and very anxious and kills three of the, the people that the Israeli Defence Force Despite have gone into. orders from the top saying the, lay off. Lay off. And then you've got the people in Gaza, apparent siege of a church. It's all just utterly ghastly. And it just feels like, as you say, that Western nations that have stood with Israel are now saying you've got to pull back from this level of bombing and uh, violence and damage that you're causing not just to the people, but to the infrastructure of Gaza. And so you've had the Germans and the British come out and say there needs to be some kind of durable ceasefire. You've had the French weigh in on that concern. All of this while the United Nations is considering a new resolution that would call for a ceasefire. Now, whether Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, takes any notice of it is a different question. But undoubtedly, the pressure on Israel to change course, 
to change the way it is prosecuting this campaign against Hamas, which is catching up so many civilians in Gaza who probably want to see the back of Hamas as well is just getting really dangerous. So over the weekend, the Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, David Cameron, wrote a joint op-ed in the Times, Sunday Times, with his German counterpart, who was actually from the Green Party, and he says, look, we come from different ends of the political spectrum, but together we are pushing the diplomatic effort to agree further pauses to get more aid in and more hostages out. Now, further pauses is not a ceasefire, and he's very clearly not using the word ceasefire. And he goes on to explain why calling for a general and immediate ceasefire is not the way forward, because he doesn't think that Hamas would respect it anyway. But clearly, at the point at which they were starting to get those hostages out, there were pauses, there were ceasefires, and those have now gone. And there is a sense, really, I think, both in this government and probably in parts of the Biden administration too, large parts of the Biden administration, that they need to tell Israel to just back off a bit now because it's gone too far, even to achieve what Israel says it wants to achieve. Whether Netanyahu who's listening or not is a different matter. But I was hearing from uh, Senator Lindsey Graham today, who is... You know, he's a Republican, he's a staunch Republican who who was a big defender of Israel. But he said the way to do this, actually, is to say, you're forgetting all your vested interests now, all those relationships forged in the Middle East, all those commercial ties that came out of the Abraham Accords, for example, with Saudi Arabia. The Saudis won't want to deal with you after this. There won't be anyone left in the Middle East who actually is able to deal with Israel. If this doesn't stop, you are creating a novel new generation of Palestinians, Gazans, who hate you and who will grow up to want to seek revenge. And so I think that message is starting to come through, but not in any tangible language that says stop to Netanyahu. Well, let's speak now to Tom Fletcher. Uh, He's a former UK ambassador to Lebanon, a foreign policy advisor to three prime ministers and best-selling author of The Ambassador and The Naked Diplomat. Tom, great to have you back on the podcast. It does seem that over the weekend there has been an important shift in the demands for a ceasefire in Gaza and from the Israelis. Do you read it like that? I think so. I I think the dial is shifting on that. I suspect that three pennies have dropped with policymakers. You know, it's taken some time in some cases, but um, I think we're getting there on these. Firstly, that you know, people recognise now that, that private persuasion is just not working uh, with Bibi Netanyahu. The reassurances that he gave the Prime Minister are just not being met. I think there's also a recognition that that Netanyahu shares one thing with Hamas, and that's a desire to bury the two-state solution in the rubble of Gaza. And I think the third element that's really shifting is just the increasing horror at what's happening on the ground, you know, the conduct of the war. So, I do feel that the uh, the dial is shifting. Tom, it's very odd when you try and read between the lines because David Cameron was writing alongside his um, German sort of green counterpart, um, said that they wanted to push for further pauses to get more aid in and more hostages out. But let us be clear, we're not calling for general and immediate ceasefire. Why is it so hard to get from that one line of language to the next, do you think? I mean, they're, they're sort of dancing on a pinhead right now. It is hard. And, and perhaps the semantics don't matter that much to, to people on on the ground. Look, I think I'd be saying unequivocally, you know, get off the fence on this and say all violence against all civilians must stop. Now, one way you can do that is by dancing on a pin and trying to get the right conditions, the right language in place for that UN Security Council resolution. I think you can be calling for a durable ceasefire, sustainable ceasefire, you know, some of the language which the Foreign Secretary used uh, in that article. I think the Brits will be trying to get into that resolution, the condemnation of Hamas terrorism. I think they'll want to get in there, that there needs to be a clear process towards hostage releases. But behind that, the reality is that a truce, whatever we call this, whatever we call a cessation of hostilities or a truce or a ceasefire, sustainable ceasefire, that break in the violence against civilians will make it more possible to get the political process in place that then we need for a genuinely durable ceasefire. That will not be about semantics at that point. 
I was just struck by what you said about the fact that Bibi Netanyahu, the appeals had fallen on deaf ears and that's why they were going public. OK, so you've had France, Germany, the UK, you've had, you know, uh, the national security advisor from the US already over there, uh, Jake Sullivan, kind of appealing for a change in the tactics of the Israelis. You've gone public, but Netanyahu might carry on regardless. Well, he might. But then it's very important at that stage, really, to, to make sure that your, your public line collectively is aligned with your values and interests. And, you know, there are bigger issues at stake here. You don't defend international law by suggesting it doesn't apply to everyone. You don't destroy a terrorist organization through terror against the people you want to reject that organization. And crucially for all our interests, you don't create a partner for peace through violence against the people you need to want that peace. You know, back in 2009, we got a ceasefire resolution. The Brits were going to abstain and the Americans were voting against. And then Gordon Brown instructed us to vote for the resolution because the language the resolution used echoed language he'd used in public. And at the last minute, Condi Rice and the Americans moved from a veto to an abstention. And so the resolution passed and a week later we had a ceasefire. So the Americans can move in our direction and these resolutions can have an effect on the ground. Tom, do you think inside the British government there is a quiet understanding now that they think Israel has gone too far? They just don't know how to say it out loud. I think there is that understanding. I mean, it's hard not to draw that understanding, observing what's happening on the ground. I think there's a quite rightly a real desire to do everything possible to ensure Israel is able to defend itself, hence the support for the Iron Dome, the most sophisticated self-defense mechanism in the world, but also to ensure that we give Israel every help in getting the hostages back. And I would say that a call for a ceasefire doesn't actually stop very targeted niche military operations to hold Hamas terrorists to account and to release those hostages. So they could be doing the the whole thing with Mossad, with special forces operations, rather than sort of, you know, cataclysmic bombardment. Is that where you're... Yeah. If we were to go back two months and a bit, a government that wasn't the Netanyahu government might have handled this a very different way. And I noticed that Ehud Olmert, a previous prime minister, was out there saying that. They could have gone for very targeted military operations, hostage releases. They could have tried to keep that international moral high ground. They could have focused on defending the borders and building that coalition to really drive for this durable peace process with the entire region. And I think we'd be in a very different situation if that had been the case. OK, I guess cynically we could say that there is no interest whatsoever for Bibi Netanyahu to aim for a two-state solution, that it serves his political purposes to drag this out for as long as he wants to make himself unremovable from power. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the Israelis, uh, and certainly the moderate Israelis, will look at it in a different way. I think a lot of people realise now that the key to getting out of this corner is actually to isolate the extremists on both sides. Clearly, you've got to isolate the Hamas terrorist leadership, but also you've got to isolate the extremists in the Israeli cabinet, who from the very beginning have been driving for this retribution, for this massive retaliation, including against civilians. I mean, I was struck, an Israeli friend um, on, on the moderate side of Israeli politics was very worried, telling me recently that he thinks that the extremists have decided to go for 50 civilian deaths for every one Israeli who was killed. And that's just a horrifying, chilling calculation. Tom, do you think if there was more direct language coming from the UK government now, and indeed the UK opposition now, then America would actually follow suit. Do you think Biden wants to wants to have somebody publicly saying that? Because, I mean, the Americans are trying to find the right form uh, that they can sign off a UN resolution to now. I think they, they wouldn't be as opposed to that as they might have been a few weeks ago, because they could then use that to channel a bit more pressure, a bit more restraint on Netanyahu by saying, look, the, we're completely isolated here in defending what's, what's going on. Yeah. But also... You know, they're frustrated with Netanyahu. You know, Biden knows knows him very, very well indeed. Blinken knows Netanyahu very, very well indeed. They know what they're dealing with. So I don't think it would do the UK uh, or the UK opposition damage uh, in Washington to come to a, a policy position based on our values and interests. And I'd, I'll be curious to see what happens if, if a resolution is put down today, tomorrow, that does echo 
David Cameron's language that he's used already, you know, the language he's moved towards since becoming foreign secretary, because, you know, I used to, to work for him as prime minister. He's not the abstaining kind. Tom, really good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Many thanks indeed. What has the demurely beige cashmere dressed John Sopel <laughs> got in common with the rather more flamboyant Grayson Perry? Well, we have both had uh, electricity and gas bills this weekend from EDF, Electricity de France, uh, which um, caused me to choke on my cornflakes on Saturday morning when I saw an email saying your standing order is going up from £150 a month to £19,200 a month. And I thought, oh, that's quite a steep rise. Hadn't anticipated that. I just thought the system had gone mad. But then I've seen on uh, Twitter or X today that Grayson Perry is in the same boat. But his bill is going up to £30,000 per month. So have the two of you started cannabis farms? (laughs) Or is there something slightly more boring and less logical to your massive rise in electricity? For that money, it would be a cannabis estate. It wouldn't just be a farm. Um, I I don't know. I mean, the, the numbers in this bill we got were just crazy. And presumably, if I've got it and Grayson Perry's got it, there are a whole bunch of other people who've got it who may not have access to social media in the way that we have, who are probably thinking, oh, my God. And with Grayson Perry, they tried to take the money out of his account. I know that. I've just had a note from EDF saying, oh, we're happy you've resolved it. Terribly sorry. But I think there is something else going on there. A glitch. I mean, do you think it was a misprint? No. No, I know. It wasn't a decimal place or anything like that. All the numbers were just mumbo jumbo that said they had to do this to our standing orders because of X. And you thought, no, no, we're in credit. Why are you doing having to do anything? I have Uh, a theory. Go on. They know how many holidays you take a year. Oh, and they just decided that is a gratuitous way <laughs> to get my holidays into this. There's an extra little bit of the untapped account. I tell you what, when I go on holidays in future, all the electricity and gas is going off. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 